And we are back for another exciting talk in the Batcave. Aditya, what, what is your excitement? Are you still fit? Are you still active to, to welcome our next speaker? Yeah. Our next speaker is Harold Campbell from MCB, and he's going to talk about ground up a different way to access, see, and think about data. I'm a data analyst myself, and I hope to learn a bit more about data with Camp Harold Campbell. So All right, Harold, welcome to the developers conference. Thank you so much. Cool. So today, as I said, I'm going to talk to you a bit about you know a different way to see and access data. Um, more specifically, I'm going to introduce you to an early preview of a, a project that I've been working on on the side. So before we jump in, a bit more about myself. I'm Harold Campbell, said. You can find me on all the social webs. I used to be an engineer many, many years ago. And presently, and then after that, I started a couple of companies. And then I moved to South Africa, and I became a management consultant, predominantly working with engineering teams. And doing Agile with those teams, helping them to improve their different Agile practices. Presently, I'm at MCB as an Agile coach, doing the same kind of thing, helping teams to become more performant and helping them to deliver better value to their customers. So related to the talk, <clears throat> I had this idea that I wanted to help teams or companies to be able to take their data and make better informed decisions, and doing this <clears throat> in reducing the time it took them to actually make those decisions. And I, I plan to do this using what they, they call lightweight computational notebooks on top of a JavaScript visualization library that I wrote, and then using Docker as my kind of CI um, build pipeline process. Now, when we talk about the computational notebooks, I'm talking about things like Jupyter Notebooks, um, Apache Zeppelin, and Observable HQ. So there was this plan that I had to go through and build these things. And the plan kind of looked like this. I talked to some customers, understand what their pain points were, what tools were they currently using, and how were they solving these problems. And then take all of that information, and in a couple of months, make this magical tool that I could just push out to the world. So I actually started talking to the customers. And around mid-March, as you know, COVID came along and threw everything up into the air. And from the, talking to the customers, especially during COVID, and observing how things were happening, kind of realized that, you know, just having data by itself is not enough, right? If you have the data, but you can't make decisions in a timely manner, then the data is useless. The key point here is that we need to act timely. And for me, personally, that meant that I needed to get to the market sooner. So this grand roadmap that I had to create this lightweight computational notebook, reuse the library, use Docker, it wouldn't fly. I wouldn't be able to get to the market in a timely manner. So I was talking to friends, um, thinking about what, what was the challenge that I was trying to solve. I figured that the best way to solve this problem was to find the simplest way to get CSV data from customers and push this into my engine. The idea being that CSV data is accessible to everyone, everybody regardless of their size, especially small companies, they have access to some way to generate CSV data. So based on this, I had to rethink what is it that, that my goal was. So the goal shifted to the focus being, you know, help medium to large companies re reduce the time it takes to make decisions. But we've been talking for a couple of minutes now, but we still haven't spoken about what is ground tap. What's this thing that I'm working on? Well, it's two things. The first is a simple tool, right? It's a web-based application that's easy to use and it helps people to make decisions. That's the part that you know we help people to make decisions. And it's still very, 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 very early in development. So I wouldn't even call it a product or a tool. It's much more like a prototype, like a proof of concept. The second part is a visualization engine that resides within the tool. And that's a flexible JavaScript library that I wrote that renders CSV on the client in real time using the data that you feed to it. And then this library is pluggable despite the fact that it's composable. And we'll talk more about what that means. Now, the library is, is still in development, but it's fairly mature. It's something that used to be open source and I moved it to close, closed source, but it can do really amazing things, even though the tool that's on top of it hasn't exposed those features yet. So let's jump into a quick demo to see what the tool looks like. All right. So here, 
with the face. With the face. Here we have the, the the starting point for the application or the web the web application. You hit create pro you hit create project, and then you're meeting you're 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 inter you're giving this interface right. It's a spa app. It has the typical components. We have some tabs. Um, we can upload some data. So let's go ahead and do that. Now, before I upload some CSV data, let's take a look at what some of the data looks like. In this particular case, we have this um, sales data, this tiny sales data set. And as you can see on line five, on row five, so let's see what would happen when we upload this into ground tap with that invalid data. So we drag it over. It tells you, gives you a quick notification that the data has been uploaded. Um, if you double click on the on the, the file that you uploaded, it can show that there were three rows that were uploaded. And then we want to start exploring the data. So we'll drag the data across, and immediately we can now see the rows for the particular for the particular data set that we uploaded. Now, key to note, I didn't call this um, uh, Excel files. I call it data stores because the intent is that in the future, I'll be able to connect to different types of data, not just CSV files, right? Nonetheless, let's go ahead and drag over some profit data. Let's drag over some uh, margin data, and let's drag over some sales data. Now, you notice that even though we have the, the invalid data, the tool was still able to go through, parse the data, and give me back some values, right? And what it's doing is an aggregate. When I click on it, you see that it's giving an aggregate, and on the side panel, it updates accordingly. So we can look at the count. We can look at the average. We can look at what was the ma maximum sale. Um, this one, we can keep it as an, an, an average. But let's look at the more meaty example. So let's go back again, find the window, drag a larger sale set. Now notice how quickly it goes through and processes your data and pulls this up. So now we have the sales data with a larger data set. And again, we have more columns, right? Let's just go through and drag the first three. So in the future, you'll be able to snap to the grid. Right now, I don't have it. I just have the grid. So we have your profits. We have, I'm going to drag through the cost of goods. Maybe put this one over here somewhere. And also, let's drag the inventory. Now, it's great if I can take aggregates, but what about trending data? So let's set this to trending, and then, you know, let's see, make this a pie chart. Well, mm, doesn't really help, so maybe a bar chart. Um, let's look at the cost of goods, and I know as a business person, you tend to want to see this as a line chart. I tend to want to see, you know, how, how are my costs going? How much, how much money am I spending or losing? And then in as inventory, Again, let's make this trending, and gee, maybe uh, let's make this some arts. Doesn't really help. Can't get enough visibility on, into this. Maybe a bubble chart. No, it'd be good if I could resize this. Well, that's kind of what the, the S in SVG means. So if I set this to 480, it automatically resizes. And if I set this to 150, again, it resizes. And I can do the same thing for the cost of goods. All right, and the inventory is kind of munched up. Let's make this a bit larger. So let's make this 780. Now, what just happened is that we were able to rescale, upload some data, sorry, upload some data, then scale the data. Eventually, I'll be able to drag this and even do more of these types of activities. But again, it's very early. So let's switch back to slides and continue here. So what did we just see? We saw a web application where we took data that was row-based. So we have record one, and it record one had four different cells, for, as an example. Then we uploaded that data from the web, the web client to the Golang server. I'm using Golang for my backend. And then we pivoted the data. So we went from going row-based to a horizontal pivot, where the rows now go down-wise, down, downwards, and we have cells going across. But in conjunction to doing that, apart from just the data that was contained in the files, I then enriched the data with the actual table information. So the data now contains or now includes the 
sell and row information. So the, the database now contains not just the data that the client would have upla uploaded, but we also include, uh, include, include the, the metadata for the particular data. The value of doing this, as trivial as it seems, is that I can now do data transactions or data merges or even future types of analytics on data that I haven't even seen yet. And I can do this across different types of data sets and also across different types of databases, maybe in, even in different regions. The tech behind this, kind of simple. It's a basic web application. There's a front end, there's a back end. Right now, the, the front end is web only. It's not resp responsive and it was not designed to be mobile first. My thinking for this is that this type of work, when you're going through trying to build a data set, explore the data, or what the data semantics are, you're potentially going to need a larger screen space. But when you're consuming the output, the visual report, then it may be OK to use a smaller screen. And for that, I can design that later in the future. Now, before I go further, I have like one principle that, or a couple of principles, but my main principle that guides me um, in how I think about doing work or prioritizing work. I need to be, be lazy, right? And this comes from Agile principle number 10, simplicity, the art of maximizing the amount of work not done. So for me, I don't want to waste time doing things that add no value, right? So I have, and based on that, I have a simple web app, a simple web server. On the web app, I have TypeScript, JavaScript, CSS. I have on the server, Golang, MongoDB, Babel, Webpack. I don't want to spend time having to try to figure out how does this library work or how does this framework work or whatever. So the simpler my stack, the easier it, it is for me to use, which is kind of the be lazy, right? The fewer things I have to think about, the easier my life is. I forgot to mention that with MongoDB, there's also JavaScript on the, on the server side. So I have some JavaScript on the front end, JavaScript on the back end makes my life easier. And then, Similarly, I have Docker right across, right across the stack. I use Docker to build, Docker to package, and then when I deploy or release, I use a Docker Alpine and I push my native, my native builds or my, my native assets using that. So why did I choose Go? Well, if I had to pick like one slide to summarize everything, this would be the slide. Go is great for building tools. And it's great for building tools, especially server-related tools, because of the last three things, right? The three first ones are important too. But for me, I found the last ones to be super important. There's built-in concurrency, and it's easy to, easy to think about how do I manage concurrency in Go. I have race, race condition detection. I can easily, while I'm compiling the code, check for race conditions without doing anything, anything else. And this is super important, especially when you're dealing with concurrency or doing things at scale, when you need to try to figure out are we, having race to, are we having race conditions? And then fi finally, the other cool thing is that you have built-in testing, right? I don't have to add another layer of complexity just to test my code. I get that for free with Golang. How I currently use Go? Well, I use it for data orchestration. We upload the data, we do some munging in the data, and then we push the data out. Um, we may need to hoist data from one environment to another environment. All of those wonderful things. That's your my data orchestration. I use it for grid, grid creation, and I also use it for the web server and everything that's related to the web server. My future plans for using Go? Well, um, security, that's super important, especially if we're dealing with other people's data. There is automation, some form of intelligence, whether it's mach machine learning or AI, um, because I want to be able to do assess, do some type of assisted learning on the data sets that, we're, that I'm going to be uploading and then trying to make recommendations for different types of ways of visualizing data. There is MapReduce, microservices. Um, based on what's in my web server, as the application becomes more complicated, I potentially will have to, to, to extract that, those things into microservices so I can scale more. And of course, batch processing. And why MongoDB? Well, here's the million dollar slide also. MongoDB by itself, natively, is great for data analytics, right? You have native MapReduce built in. MongoDB easily handles millions of records without a problem. 
we can scale it easily. So right now I have one instance running on my machine. And if I needed to run multiple instances, it's not, a, it's not hard to do. It supports server-side JavaScript, yay. And of course, there is plugin for Hadoop, right? So when I need, if I ever become successful at this, and I have billions or hundreds of millions of data, data to ingest, then it's not a problem. The next thing I want to talk about briefly is this idea of creativity versus the tool, right? What are the things that should constrain you when you're thinking about building stuff? Is it your creativity? Is it your tool? Let's look at this by way of an example. Now, not the biggest football fan, but I know that there's a, a, a feud between Arsenal and other teams, Manchester and so forth. This is a poster that was done for Arsenal. This is the visualization that was done, predominant of the hero image, where we have this arc and we have this very beautiful visualization. So the question that I'm asking, what would be required to build this in your current tool, right? And we're talking about that thing in the center, not the, not the shield, but the visualization that goes around it. If you had to do this in your current tool, quick second and think about that. And I'm, I'm thinking like, Tools like Power BI, Tableau, Excel, Matplotlib, D3JS, you know, how would you build this? In fact, is it even possible for you to easily build this or just to build this at all? And if you look closer, just to give you a, a bit more perspective, we just have trivial, not trivial information, but we have pertinent information, which matches were played, how did they win, when were the goals scored, and the visual elements are, are kind of trivial, right? It's text, it's arcs, it's you know, some kind of line graph, it's a bubble chart. How would we build this? Well, let's look at demo number two. Ooh. And now I'm showing you, what I'm showing you now is the visualization, um, a gallery from the visualization library that I wrote. And all of these things were written um, or can be written by the existing library. So even though the tool that I showed you earlier doesn't have a rich set of visualizations yet, I just haven't had a chance to expose them, but it can be done. Here's an example, pretty trivial example that was built with the tool. You know, we have a stack polygon, we have some donuts, we have some bar charts, we have a segment chart. Um, this was on the cover of Time Magazine, and I re recreated it by using some arcs, which re resulted in this. And just to show you the code, that's a highlighted code. We use this arcs code here to generate that image. This is the data that we then use to generate the, the rest of the actual things that we're trying to highlight in the visualization. We're able to merge them, then we styled it, and presto, we would have had the cover of times if we needed to build this. I saw this image on Dribble, and I was like, gee, how would you actually build this? Well, if you think about and decompose it, it's just some arcs, right? For me, I want to then add some labels. I'm a huge fan of the type of hero movies, Avengers, Star Wars, and so forth. Um, so I want to see what would the data look like if I had to put that using this visualization to see where the money is being made. And that's what it would look like or earlier. Or, or a friend of the one, the red one from Arsenal that we saw late, earlier, right? This is a visualization that was made using the, using ground tab. So let's go back to slides. So this, this design person, when I first saw this, I was blown away. I was so intrigued because I really want to know, you know, how, how did they do this? What was required to do this? So if we think about this that I just showed you, that, grow, that, we, that I created with ground tab, if we decompose the visual elements, right? So this is the big thing. If we decompose the visual elements, that gray bar, there are a couple of those gray, gray arcs. There's some text that flows along the gray arc. There are a list of months, and each month goes along a gray, a gray ring, which itself is another arc. Then we have a dot on each month that shows when, when the project was done. And then we have a line just for aesthetics that goes down to that particular dot. Then we have a bigger red circle um, that shows how much money he potentially made relative to the others for that particular project. Then we have some more accents, which are those green arcs. 
And then on the outer part, we have some smaller arcs that show the distribution of time um, across the entire, for that particular client. So the question is, what does this look like in code? Well, we have arcs. Now, if we stop a minute and read this, it reads GTAP arcs, there is some data, and there's some kind of X, Y, so we're setting some kind of X. We set the arc radius, we set the spread, and there's some other things. There's some styling and some other nice things. All right. We want some text along the path, so we call something that's called text along path, and then we want to actually just wrap the text. And of course, there's something where we can, vert we can vertically align the text, which is there on the second line. line. This is a two-part block. The first part says, hey, I want some ellipses, which are the gray arcs. And then along the ellipses, the ellipses radially, I want to be able to put some text, which is, and then we style it with a red. And also we have things like, you know, I want the short, the short form of the month names. Next, we want to have the lines and we define where the points of the line should be. And of course we style it. And then the black dots, they themselves are just ellipses. We set their size to 1.5 pixel. And then we say where each of them should be. And then of course, how much money he made, the relative sizing is done based on, again, another set of ellipse calls, visualization calls. We set the size, we say where it should be, we set the color. And of course, there are the green accents, which are again arcs, and we can see where we're setting the style to be 60. And then there are the outer arcs, right? And it's just a bunch of arcs. And you've seen this pattern so far, right? We set the, the position using some actions, we set the radius, we potentially rotate it, there's some style and there's, yeah, there's style. Now, if you have to think about this, you don't have to change your mental model from what we described earlier. The code describes its intent. We want arcs, we want text along path, a path, we want more ellipses, we want text, so forth and so forth, right? So regardless of what you have in your head or how complex it is, once you can decompose it, you should have a tool like Roundtap you should have a tool that can actually help you to think in your mental model, all right? So what we just saw is that we had some individual components and individual visual components. We took those visual components, we applied some data to them, then we applied some actions, and then we got a visualization. For me, this is super powerful because it's super flexible. Because then I can take, I can build any visualization I can think of and of course, I can also make templates for future use. So the perspective is you should be limited by your creativity, not by your tool. Right? And that's super important because nowadays what I find is that a lot of our tools are baked in and everything is rigid. You can't change it beyond what the designer created. And that, for me, kills your, your, your creativity. So next, for the rest of the time, I wanted to share some of my learnings um, and, of course, some of my failings. So the first thing is, you know, what does good enough mean? Good enough for me spans three things. The thing must be working, right? If we build it, we're going to give it to customers. Whatever we're pushing out, it must work. So it must run without major errors. And each thing, even if, even if the entire thing isn't finished, like what I showed in that tool, it must be able to do something meaningful. It must be able to add value. So the mindset for me is that every build should get shit done, right? Now, to, to make sure that the thing that you're building is usable, it means that it can't have major errors because then it won't be able to provide value to the people you're pushing it to. The, the design should be obvious. So let me ask you a question. Or just think on this. When was the last time you had to think about using a spoon? Right? You pick it up, you use it. The design is implicit, it's built in. You don't have to think about it. Here's another question. For persons who have um, like the most recent uh, smart devices, the, the iPhones and the Android phones, Huawei and so forth, when was the last time you had to read the instruction manuals to these devices? So. And, and I think the answer would be, well, you've probably never read it, right? The reason being is that when we're designing for others, when we're designing our tools, we need to design for others. That's where empathy comes into play. We need to design an experience 
in mind of the other people. And then we need to abstract away the complexity from the user so that the design is obvious. And this thing, obvious by design, is hard, by the way. Right? The final thing for good enough is, you know, there's a, a known fact that 80% of everything that we build is not used. So for me, the question always is, you know, what's the 20% of things that I need to build? So I don't spend time trying to make the perfect application or trying to make sure everything works exactly as, as I have it in my head. If it's usable, if it adds value, then that's good enough. And I'm also actively always trying to figure out what are the core features that I need? What are the, the necessary features I need? And then build those. The next thing is, you know, you want to version everything, version control everything. Now, I'm not saying you have to use Git per se. I'm saying that you need some kind of version management. And I'm also saying that your version management should also kind of dictate how you work. So what this means is that you don't want to be spending um, two days, and at the end of two days, that's when you push something to production. Not really, right? What you want to be doing is, from my perspective, again, this is just my humble perspective, you want to have small commits, and you want to commit frequently. The reason for this is that if you decide, if you go down a path that doesn't make sense, you, you, you don't have that fear of going, Jesus, I can't get rid of this code because I've invested so much into it. Right, so you treat your version control as a part of. It's like it's like a partner, you know. I write some code. This looks good. It adds value. Check. All right. It's not this admin tool that I have to do. Oh my God! Now it's time to check because somebody told me I have to use version control. Types, especially like like for me, I I in my system, the few moving pieces, great. And for quite a while, I tried and I avoided using TypeScript. A couple months ago, or a couple weeks ago, August 16 to be exact, at 8.07 p.m., I was struggling with GroundTap, um, specifically because I couldn't keep everything in my head anymore. And at that point, uh, I was like, you know what, to hell with it. It's, it's time to actually move to TypeScript or the newest version of TypeScript and stop struggling with so many things that a tool can help me with. And for those who haven't used TypeScript before, TypeScript is just JavaScript plus type, types. More specifically, it's ECMAScript plus types. And why I'm calling this out instead of listing a version is because almost every year we have a new version of JavaScript. And not only do we have a new version, the browsers are also now keeping up. In most cases, they're around six months behind after a new version comes out. So let's look at this piece of code that I have here. Don't need to read it. The point is, this code is failing. There's a problem. When I mouse over without having to run a build, I can immediately get an error from the type system that says, hey, there is something that's wrong. And the reason why I'm getting that is because of this particular type annotation. The particular error that I'm, I've, I got when I wrote this code, and that was real code that I wrote recently, right? It's an insidious piece of code that would have taken hours and hours and hours on end to find if I didn't have some form of type annotation. The type of error, I forgot an S. So instead of saying arcs, I had arc. And typically, especially when you're working with multiple environments, it's kind of painful to find these kinds of errors. Thankfully, if you're using something like TypeScript or some type language, that's reduced. I'm also not a big fan of front-end libraries. It doesn't mean I haven't used them in the past. But from my perspective, it's just, and again, my perspective, I don't code a lot anymore, right? So when, I, when I'm writing code, I need to get in, get out. And I find that there's added complexity using most of these libraries. So again, I think with ES6+, Plus, you, know, you don't need fewer libraries in the future. My favorite feature, however, from JavaScript or modern JavaScript are your arrow functions. With this one line of code, I can go from having square charts to rounded charts like this. So my perspective, the future of the web is TypeScript, is types, um, and JavaScript. I also didn't use React, as I said, but I am using Babel for JSX, 
and this is what it looks like for me, and I also created my own generator. I do have frustrations with JavaScript. It's still JavaScript. We still have problems with numbers and precision, and I don't have, and you still have browser inconsistencies. So the tool that I showed you at the first demo doesn't work in Safari. Don't know why, have to go figure it out. So some tips if you're rolling your own library, make it usable from day one, right? And also think about your users, think about the UX and make it reusable. The bars that I just showed you, it's obvious what we're trying to, to say here because of the, how it was written. The intent is clear. I want some bars. I want to posi position them at the X location. There's a maximum height, blah, 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 blah. So it's both usable and reusable because I've spent quite a bit of time on the UX, the use of how others would consume this library. The solid principles, they're your friends. Right? And I do know that solid was written for uh, object-oriented libra libraries. But particularly these two, the single responsibility and interface segregation. And I'm not going to go into them, but I've literally used these to guide how I think about writing my library. In future proofing your library, there are a couple of tips that I have. Um, refactor for simplicity and readability. Adopt as much functional programming patterns as you can. Prefer declarative over imperative. Be opinionated and have intelligent defaults. I learned that from Rails. Um, have a basis for good test hygiene. So let's quickly look at some of these. So when I talk about adopt um, fun as much functional patterns as possible, this is kind of what I'm talking about. So think about having pure functions. Um, think about immutable data. Think about avoiding shared states. You want to have your data versus your behavior and, and how we modify the data to be separate things. You want to treat functions as first class citizens, which is great for JavaScript, and if possible, functional components. So let's look at immutable data and how it works in, Java, in, in ground tab. So firstly, we have this thing we call a container that gives you a context. We pass it to the render visuals. And then from there, I create a new container and that's what I mutate when I call these two highlighted functions. Inside of the create visual that I pass the container to, what I'm going ahead and doing is just cloning the existing container and uploading the children. So I'm making a deep copy. And then that's what I pass back out. That's mutated, right? So if I call this render visual function several different times with the same data, I'm going to get the same result. Functions as first class citizens, all right? This is a good example that I found on the web. I didn't have time to copy my own code to show you, but I can actually treat, because of the arrow functions, I can actually pass around functions and then wire those together. When we talk about prefer declarative over imperative, if you look on the right-hand side, imperative describes the how. So if you were to read this code at 2 a.m. in the night, it's kind of hard to figure out. By the way, I don't advocate programming at 2 a.m. in the night. But this code is kind of hard to figure out what you're doing. The, on the declarative side, which describes the what, it's much, more, it's much clearer that we're trying to get just the adults from the students. And then once we found the adult students, we want to format their names. And this is something that I've applied in my own code. So I, it, so I consistently go through my code, look at what I have, and then go, you know, are we seeing patterns? Is it hard to understand what is being said or what is being done? And then I refract, refactor those into, into actions, right? I try to make it more declarative. So in the past, it wasn't really clear. Now it's kind of clear. I want to align the visual to the bottom. Intent is clear. So declarative programs promote better engineering practices. It gives you simpler logic. It improves readability. I have found that it, it, it makes it easier to test and fast to debug. Personally, I use a text editor. I use VS Code. I don't use an IDE or a bugger because I try to pre I predominantly write using declarative practices. So I don't find the need for a, a heavy, bulky um, IDE. If we look at this visual, right, when we try to understand what are the things that are here, well, it's a bunch of visuals that were declaratively described. We had some arcs, there are some connecting lines, there are some ellipses, there are some segments, there are some labels. Which takes us to when I say be opinionated and have intelligent defaults. Well, what does that mean? All of the actions that mutate the visual nodes in the visualizations 
fall into one of these three categories. And the naming is, predict is predictable. If I want to update the X, there's an X. If I want to increment the X position, there's an X. If I want to talk about the maximum width, there's something called maximum width. If I want to talk about arcs, most of the actions that mutate under the arcs are pre prefixed with arcs. And each of these actions have a predictable default. So in closing, what I want to say to you, right, is don't be limited by your tools. If you find that the tools aren't helping you to achieve the things that you want to do, then go forth and make something awesome. You know, challenge the status quo. And with that, I'd like to say thank you for listening. I'm Harold Campbell. And if you want to follow along um, what I'm building, you can visit Ground Tap here and drop your name in the waiting list. And the slides are at the bottom of the screen. Cool. Thank you so much. Gents, I'll hand over to you for questions. I would like to ask you, oh, in fact, I would like to reply to one of your questions that you asked about that uh, job. So I would not do the, in fact, in my, in my job as a data analyst, I just prepare the data. I will just leave it for front end, the front end developers to make those charts and I'll fill it, fill the data in with my API. But, uh, uh, in your experience, do you think that this is possible with uh, Python libraries such as Matplotlib or Biplot? So, the, in, I'm trying to find the the initial plan. The initial plan was to create um, this thing that we're seeing here. So, I think it's possible, right? But I think it's hard. So this. This thing that you're seeing here on the screen, this this was a part of the early version of the, the 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 computational notebook that I was creating, and what I find that with things like Mat Matplotlib and these tools is that it's kind of hard to go from cleaning the data, creating a pipeline for cleaning the data, then merging everything to give me something like like say this this entire screen, right? Because from my perspective, this entire screen that you're seeing could be a report. You can you can do this chart, this one visual here with my, my plot lid. You could easily do that. And Keynote just died. I don't know why Keynote just died. But you could do this one part. But it would be difficult to say, hey, I want to build this entire page um, along with the data and then share it with somebody to go and consume the data. Um, uh, but for actually that piece of work, I use well personally me. I use a Python notebook or Jupyter or even Google Colab. So exactly that way. Yeah, yeah. You, you can uh, include reports, code, notes, or charts, pictures, even pictures. Yeah, I think and, it's cool. And for me, for me, I was competing with those. With those applications, I was actually going, "Hey, how could I actually do this, um, but do it better and easier than what we were doing?" Um, because yes. Jupyter, I find, when I spoke to data scientists, it's great to explore data in Jupyter, but then it becomes difficult when I need to package that and release it. Um, yeah, yeah. And and that's my yeah. form when I spoke to data scientists because I did speak to a couple. Um, it's hard to go from I've explored the data, I've created the model. Now, how do I share this to my peers or to an executive? Um, you wouldn't have had that problem if I continued continued along this path. Exactly. But that's a good question. Thank you so much. Uh, questions? These are really just the few questions that I had. Joki, do you have anything to add? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean. Uh... The concept about picking up um, different designs and then seeing how it can be um, put into your, your own projects. Um, it's pretty impressive to, about what you already achieved here on an early stage. Uh, one of the things that I'm a bit curious <laughs> is um, uh, it seems that you are using a, a number of um, open source software, uh, poss possibly MIT licensed uh, libraries. What gave you then the impulse to actually go forward with with, uh, with closing your your previously open source activities? 
Yeah. So, for one, maintaining was a problem. Um, so the, the original version is still there, right? But then once I decided I want to go a for-profit, um, there was some of that. And then how do I keep the two back, back and forth? So the libraries that I'm using are, there's Babel, there is, um, there is the MongoDB. So at some point, I may branch, ground tap the, visual, the visualization library back into open source. But no, mm -hmm. I think it makes more sense for what I'm trying to do and how do I support the community in making that part closed source and focusing on it? That's a super good question. <laughs> All right. In uh, in regards to um, compatibility, scalability, I mean, you were mentioning that you're using MongoDB. Um, how do you see or how do you position then GroundTap in regards to um, operating it on the cloud? Or would this be the wrong environment? I mean, there's something like Cosmos DB available by Microsoft. Uh, you can easily run uh, MongoDB on other cloud providers. What's your position into this regard? I'll show you. Um, I, no, let me not say that. So at some point, right now what I'm doing, I'm using DigitalOcean and that's my primary provider. At some point as the library grows or as the application grows and I need um, more horsepower or, or more scalability, I will have to think about one of those things and not do my own my own ops, right? Right now, I find it to be easier. Mongo has great support, as you said. Um, there are other providers, other cloud providers that can help with the ops and help with scaling it. But for me to think about it, how do I build this? How do I release it? I can easily go and manage this by myself, even as I get to like hundreds of millions of records. Um, over the last two weeks, I got up to a couple of thousand records and it was quite easy on my machine. And I think that with this one man development person coming home in the evenings, banging on the code on my keyboard, working on the weekends, um, even when I get to a couple million records, it will not be a problem. But as soon as I pass that threshold to like a couple hundred million, um, then I need to find a better suitable enterprise type solution because I am not an ops person. I wouldn't even call myself a good engineer. I'm an okay engineer. All right, right. We have a nice question from the from the uh, chat. Do you mind showing your last slide again, please? <laughs> last slide. Yes, the last slide. Put it in in full screen. <laughs> there you go. Where did you get that jersey? <laughs> I actually made that. I actually made that. All right. So I I do knit. I promise. Oh, awesome! <laughs> uh, is it is it then to to you know? I guess, I, I mean I can imagine it keeps you um, you know distracted yeah. that you can actually reflect on a couple of things that you get your thoughts together and actually be creative. Yes, yes. So I do carpentry and I do knit and I do bake and I do cook. Um, <laughs> so I, I do the things. <laughs> Awesome, awesome, awesome. Mm, awesome. Yeah, um, on the other side, I mean, you're saying your tool is at the moment in a very, 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 very early stage. Um, what's the roadmap for the next couple of months, maybe years? Um, where do you see yourself maybe then by the end of 21? So right now I can only merge, uh, I can only, I can only work on, I want to become a, I want to become OLAP compliant, but OLAP compliant at, on scale, at scale. So the measures that I showed you when I dragged those column names into the visualization, each, mm -hmm. of, each of those was just one measure. So I wanted to be able to, I want to be able to go to the average SME or the average business owner and say, here, um, upload some data and tell me what you're seeing. And without calling uh, somebody like a data expert or a data scientist, they can easily move around in the tool themselves. You know, they can merge visualizations, they can merge uh, data points, they can explore and tell a rich picture or story about their data. And of course, they can share reports both with their, with their clients, both with their staff, 
So that's kind of what I'm planning right now. Finish the tool, make it more usable, make it more user friendly. Mm -hmm. So how I had to type in the width and the column. Um, next week, I'll be able to get that done. Allow people to connect to not just CSV, but to also um, JSON, JSON APIs that, that give you JSON type data. Um, there's quite a bit of open source data repositories. I want to be able to include that. So if you're doing something like Kaggle or you're a data scientist and you want to practice your own data models or your own visualizations, you should be able to do that from within this tool. For some of the clients I spoke to, having a semantic layer is super important. So how do I automate ETL? How do I ensure that there's auditing? Um, how do I ensure there's governance? So there's an entire design that has been done for those particular elements. So your governance, semantic layer, um, security mm -hmm. reporting. Um, and of course, it's a bit for end user. So after I've designed a visualization um, or something that's pulling from data, I can give it to an account executive. And they can go and say, hey, I need to chase this target or a sales executive um, or a senior executive. So it's all of those things that are on the roadmap. So I, I hope to be able to get most of those done by mid-2021. Um, I'm continuing to talk to customers. So it is being driven by the conversations I'm having with customers. So I, awesome. I talk to them. They tell me what their problems are. I listen. I go, hmm, how would I solve that? Kind of like that iterative loop. All right, wonderful. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah. Cool. All right, um, Harold, thank you so much uh, for your talk. Um, it's looking impressive already at this early stage. Um, from our side, from the community side, uh, definitely thumbs up and um, wishing you all the best uh, on your on your side project. <laughs> and uh, yeah, also thank you so much that um, as a um, Uh, with your own project, but also um, in regards that um, one of our partners, MCB, uh, gives us here the ability to run this kind of event. Um, with that, um, I hope that you're following the other sessions and also the track then tomorrow. And again, thank you so much for your time and uh, looking forward to meet at the Digital Factory one day again. Yeah, man. Thank you so much. Enjoy your day, gentlemen. And thank you. Stay tuned and see you.